I'm Scott Lachlan, this is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. Today, we're going to be talking about insider threats. You may have heard past episodes where we identify what is an insider threat and how is it that an insider threat is different than other types of cybersecurity concerns that organizations have and how an organization may start to kick off an insider threat investigation. And the thing about insider threats that I find to be so difficult and one of the areas that truly trouble a lot of our clients is that insider threats present so many different angles and so many different components that it makes it difficult for any organization to plan for how to conduct one in the United States, in the EU, and then globally. And the thing about that is that oftentimes insider threats are going to be global in nature. And so the next three episodes that we have planned in this series is really to try to extract the learnings that we have come to gain through those global investigations. And so I'm so excited to have two panelists here today, Basila Dallas, my partner in our Los Angeles office, and Adam Cook, another key team member on our cyber litigation team, to really talk about how insider threat investigations are structured from a U.S. perspective. And then in a future episode, we'll talk about the EU aspects of that. And then finally, how to conduct insider threat investigations in Asia PAC. So Vasi, Adam, welcome to the podcast. So Adam, maybe I can ask you to get us kickstarted here. So I'm interested in your perspective on insider threats in general, but importantly, one of the areas that I know you spend a lot of time on with your clients in conducting these investigations is really a focus on attorney-client privilege. So if I think to myself, what is different about a U.S. investigation versus an European investigation versus an investigation in Asia-Pac, we're really going back to some of those legal principles that are uniquely applied in the United States and may apply differently in the United States than they do in other regions. So maybe with that, ask you, how do you see the importance of attorney-client privilege in connection with an insider threat investigation? Great. Thanks, Scott. And as you kind of flagged at the outset there, privilege is a key consideration, particularly in the U.S., where privilege protections are in generally speaking, higher than they are in other jurisdictions, particularly certain jurisdictions in the EU, Asia, and other places around the world. And so with that kind of background principle in mind, we always like to think of trying to maximize those privilege protections from a U.S. perspective, because there are pretty robust protections that can be available to folks, again, to try to minimize the potential risk associated with these investigations. Scott, as I know you've covered in your prior podcast in the series, Insiders' threats pose a real challenge for companies because they really go to the heart of what potential employee misconduct could it be at issue? Could it be an intentional misconduct where an employee was deliberately misusing and abusing their access to gain you know, entry into sensitive information and potentially disseminating that to third parties? Or is this an instance where Perhaps an employee or other personnel was acting unintentionally and left the door open, so to speak, or did things in a way that inadvertently exposed data. And so when you don't know, when you're going into investigation and don't know, are you dealing with deliberate misconduct? Are you dealing with negligence? Are you dealing with perhaps a false positive, right? Maybe there isn't an insider threat. We just don't know. With all those possibilities floating around, it's key to protect the process by which you're investigating and all the key information that is being fed into the legal analysis. And so to that end, from a U.S. perspective, the two key protections out there are the attorney-client privilege and the attorney work product doctrine. The attorney-client privilege is designed to protect confidential communications that are in furtherance of the provision of legal advice at its most highest level. And then the attorney work product protection is designed to protect work product, so written and other types of guidance, documentation, et cetera, prepared by attorneys or at the direction of attorneys in connection with anticipated litigation. And these two key protections are kind of foundational to how we think about these investigations and kind of the key tools that we think about in terms of how to protect that from potential disclosure down the road to folks who are trying to kind of open the hood and look inside. So I think 
taking a step back again, Scott, so from a high level perspective, to maximize those protections, the key is to set up a team and a process by which you can control and limit the amount of information sharing to kind of a key group of folks of individuals. And that is kind of the the key ingredient here. And Vasi, I don't know if you have any perspectives on how to to kind of kick that off in terms of this more limited and set of folks who are key to an internal investigation from a U.S. perspective. Yeah, so I think there are two key components. The first is making sure that you're setting up your investigation under privilege. And then the second is making sure you're maintaining the privilege throughout the investigation. And I think some of the tips differ depending on you know what stage you're in, but at least at the outset, setting up your investigation to maintain privilege is critically important. And when we're talking about insider threats, just given the number of potential variables and people who have potential involvement, it is critical that you start with your core group of stakeholders who are working on the investigation. And if you are in-house, you're at a company and you're thinking about how to set this up, I think a key piece to consider is bringing in your outside counsel or setting up, if you're not in a position to bring in outside counsel yet, setting up the investigation through legal and making sure you create an initial list of key stakeholders who have need to know privileges and who can understand that this is a privilege investigation that's being conducted at the direction of counsel, that you're keeping the group small at the front end. And if you need to expand, you can expand later. But I think at the outset, just making sure you have a grasp on the key stakeholders in an investigation to begin setting it up under privilege is going to be a critical first step. That is a really interesting point and maybe one that I want to make sure we have a chance to discuss. Insider threats are going to require a multidisciplinary approach to be able to address. I think that's true in all cyber cases where the three of us and the other members of our team are often having to bring together a diverse set of stakeholders throughout an organization. And that can be in the form of your legal team and your cybersecurity team and your privacy compliance team and the business teams. And as I think about what the stakeholders would be needed as part of an insider threat investigation, it's that group plus more, right? Now we have employment, we potentially have IP, we have folks within different departments and functions. And so interested in your perspective on the challenges and opportunities and areas of really to focus, if you'd say, okay, I need to have that team be large enough to represent all of these key stakeholders, how do I do that in a way that's going to be protective of privilege while at the same time not undermining it by having so many other team members involved. Yeah, so I think if we just think about the team first being internal only plus outside counsel, we can start there. And then we can talk about how the team might grow with a third party assessor, for example, or an expert who you bring in to evaluate the incident. But if you're talking about a large initial group, given the number of stakeholders, departments, and issues that would be implicated. I know you said, Scott, employment, right? You think HR, privacy, technology teams, legal. It is difficult to sort of maintain a smaller need-to-know group. But I think what you do there is make sure that your team understands that this investigation is being conducted by legal, that it is a legal-driven investigation, meaning that people shouldn't go on their own journey as part of the investigation and loop in additional stakeholders, or if they you know, don't have an answer, they're forwarding emails without the proper protections. And I think ultimately this comes down to what kind of training are you doing for your stakeholders across the organization who are not in legal functions, but who need to understand how to be involved and how to maintain privilege in a privileged investigation. And so I think it's about clear communication. It's about making sure that people are keeping the inquiries and the correspondence under you know, a specific umbrella of people who need to know. And that when there are doubts or questions that you are asking asking your lawyer, that you're asking the company's counsel. It's always better to pick up the phone if you have a question about whether you can or should not or 
cannot do something in order to maintain privilege rather than to sort of make an educated guess and proceed on your own. I think every in-house counsel would feel much more comfortable if their clients came directly to them if they had questions about what to do or what not to do in a privilege investigation. And so I think the best answer is have training at the outset, even before an insider threat and before a cyber investigation where you're doing, you know, routine training every six months or every year for your key stakeholders to understand the attorney-client privilege doctrine, to understand attorney work product. And then at the time that the investigation kicks off, that you're refreshing everyone's memories about what rules are in place. So that's what I would say about the internal piece of it. But I think, you know, when you start bringing in external parties, the conversation changes a little bit. And I think that might be a good place to go. And I know Adam has done a ton of advising on third party assessors who come in to an investigation. Hey, Adam, I'm interested in your views on the third party kind of assessment and how to bring in those parties. But in your response, I'm interested also in a dynamic policy that you're describing in those training programs. And how is it that we're educating our stakeholders about what attorney-client privilege is, why it's important, how to preserve it. I think one of the things that we don't want to do is underestimate the importance and prominence of corporate-wide gossip. When we're talking about a threat actor in Eastern Europe or somebody who is overseas and you say this person has stolen data, certainly there is a lot to talk about. But when we start now saying, oh, well, we could have been Jim from down the hall, or could be Susie, who I just went to a barbecue with on Sunday, it takes on a whole other different layer because your social networks and the professional networks are the same between the people who are doing the investigation and the potential people who are subject to the investigation. So interested in your perspective on how to maintain confidentiality with that dynamic in place? And what is the message that we need to be delivering to those stakeholders during the course of that investigation? Scott, I think it is human nature to be interested in that element of an insider threat investigation, especially if it may involve some of your peers or their suspicions about the company. And it's human nature to be curious about that. It's also human nature to talk about that. But I think ultimately, it is important to reiterate to your clients at the company, to your stakeholders, that they must act in the best interest of the company. And because this is being conducted under privilege, no information can be disclosed to third parties outside of the investigation, and that ultimately you are putting the company in legal risk by doing so. And so I think it is empowering the stakeholders to act in the best interest of the company and in furtherance of the investigation and to keep as tight of a leash as is possible with the people who need to know. And certainly giving guidance that if someone comes up to you, tries to bait you or ask you questions about what's going on, that you have almost a canned response that could be as simple as, look, I can't talk to you about that. I'm not permitted to talk to you about that and sort of cut the conversation short. Yeah, I think the one thing I'd add to agree with everything that Vasi just said is kind of one way we work to implement or operationalize that type of strategy is to have clear communications at the outset to all the stakeholders who are within this internal investigation tent. So there's kind of like a either in memo form, email form, or some other form that outlines those key directives to individuals. So everybody's on the same page about the purpose of the investigation and the do's and don'ts, the rules of the road, so to speak. So if someone asks you to divulge what you've learned as part of this group, as Fossey said, you're kind of empowered to answer that correctly in a way that deflects and would not reveal information that is of sensitive nature and information that you shouldn't be disclosing to our wider audience unless and until the time is appropriate. And I think that's kind of the key messaging that we try to direct here is that, as Vasi said, this is for in the company's interest, and it doesn't help anybody to speculate. It doesn't help anybody to make guesses. Let's get to the bottom of this, and let's find out what happened, and then we can all make the right decisions based on that. So I think that kind of framing is often helpful to try to take the temperature down a little bit and make people understand that there is a process here and we're going to follow the process and deviations from that just don't help anybody, particularly the company. 
So Adam, on that point, interested also, right, on your perspective where things can, doing all of the things that we just described and following the playbook in the exact way that we wanted to apply it, where things can still go awry. I'm thinking of examples that I think we have seen in the past where we have identified an investigative team. We define an overall objective and strategy to be able to try to achieve that objective. And then it turns out that perhaps somebody who has been read in to the investigative team is the person of interest who perhaps doesn't have the company's best interest at heart and may be part of the insider threat group. If we find ourselves in kind of that situation, right, where we have been operating with the understanding and they express agreement from all involved that they were a part of the privilege team and the discussions around the attorney-client privilege was intended to surround the communications with those individuals, including the thoughts and impressions of the lawyers as we conduct this investigation. And it turns out they end up using that for their own purposes, outside the purposes of what we describe that. Does that mean that privilege is invalidated? I mean, how should we be on the lookout and continuing to anticipate that our friends at the start of an insider threat investigation may not be our friends at the very end of that investigation. No, Scott, it's a great flag. And that is you know, always a challenge with insider threats, right? Is because you're kind of going into it, not knowing who, as you said, the persons of interest are. And I think that just underscores the criticality of being nimble and being able to adapt who is kind of essential to the investigation and how you're shaping it. So for example, if the person of interest turns out to be a member of the internal investigation team, I think in those situations, there has to be a quick pivot in order to reshape the group and to make determinations about how to deal with that individual. Those conversations will almost certainly involve the HR or people function of a company in conjunction with legal and others to determine how best to mitigate the risk created by that individual being part of the privileged conversation. And to your question, Scott, simply because a person has potentially misused their access or being part of the privileged group doesn't necessarily mean there's a waiver. It's really going to be context and fact dependent. So for example, if there is written work product that the individual disseminates to a third party, that does not always affect a waiver because the work product doctrine, it is not ipso facto the case that simple dissemination to the third party will waive that. And so it's a much more nuanced analysis. And so there'll have to be careful consideration given to let's figure out if this individual has abused their participation in the group to try to waive those protections, whether disseminating it to a third party disseminate it to a bunch of other internal stakeholders who weren't part of the privilege team? And then what can be done to mitigate that risk? Whether it's clawing things back, sending notes to those individuals where they're sent that it was sent in error, or a host of other actions that could be undertaken, whether it's email monitoring consistent with HR and other obligations and state law, or other types of proactive threat mitigation that can be undertaken. That's, I think, my perspective. And Vasi, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Exactly right. So Vasi and Adam, I want to circle back on a point, Vasi, that I think you were making and asking Adam's point of view on, and that is when we are identifying and assembling that group of stakeholders, we have the internal stakeholders and then we have externals, right? Whole investigation clearly needs to be done at the direction of counsel to make it attorney-client privilege preferably outside counsel, where there's a stronger argument around turning client privilege than inside counsel, although inside counsel still has a basis for expressing privilege, if I understand it correctly. But we often are going to need the expertise and input from third parties to be able to help the legal team form legal-related conclusions and be able to advise our clients appropriately. And so an example of that would be likely the forensics companies who help us identify where they see potential areas of cybersecurity concerns. So in any cyber 
case, uh, including insider threats, we're looking at all of the information that's available. Oftentimes, we don't have somebody coming out and saying, you know, this is what I did, and this is how I did it, and this is the vulnerabilities that I exploited to be able to do it, here's what I stole. Sometimes we get lucky and they say that, but oftentimes they don't. And so we need to have somebody to come in to help the legal team to understand what has happened, how it happened, what is the legal ramifications of that happening, and that often means that we need a third party to come in to assist us. And that, I think, presents a different type of privilege concern, but all gets pulled into this privilege-related strategy. So, Adam, interested in your perspective on this, I know this is an area where I think the law is developing quite rapidly. Where is the current state of law around privilege with respect to those third-party forensics companies engaged by counsel? Yeah, and as you said, Scott, these third parties are often critical for helping a company get to the root cause of an insider threat and peel back the layers of that onion to see exactly what happened. And from a U.S. perspective, this is a little bit unique from other jurisdictions. There are more robust privilege protections when counsel, particularly outside counsel, Mm -hmm. does retain a third party to assist them in rendering legal advice to the company regarding these risks. And so there is a pretty strong body of case law that says, yes, these types of arrangements can be cloaked in privilege. Now, of course, the devil is in the details, as you alluded to, Scott, and kind of one of the key things we look at when we're trying to maximize privilege protections for a third-party vendor, is there a pre-existing relationship between the company or organization and that vendor? That has proven to be a key factor in the evolving case law here. I think maybe five, eight years ago, our perspective on this would be very different than it is today. But today, I think it's fair to say that courts are a little bit more skeptical of these arrangements and we'll we'll kick the tires and see if in fact, the vendor is being retained for a legal purpose. And one of the factors they look at is, is there a relationship between the organization and the vendor that pre-exists this particular engagement and suggest that the relationship was for what I'll call more business purposes. So everyday cybersecurity services, everyday threat intelligence, or other services that that vendor may be providing. And if there is a pre-existing relationship between the organization and the vendor, courts are going to be more skeptical because lawyers coming swooping in after the fact and saying, oh, this is going to be an arrangement expressly at our direction, they're going to be a little bit more skeptical of that. So key factor one is, is there a pre-existing relationship? If there is, there are ways to kind of mitigate that and kind of create a separate work stream for privileged work with that vendor, but it's certainly one you'd have to look at. And then another key factor is making sure once you've kind of understand the scope and the nature of the relationship between the parties, papering it in a way that maximizes those protections. So creating the master services agreements, statements of work, work orders, all the other paperwork that goes into these arrangements in a way that makes clear that the work is being performed at the direction of counsel. So there are often key language and provisions that are necessary to include, again, to kind of maximize those protections and convince courts that in fact, the work is being done for purposes of assisting counsel to render legal advice. Vasi, interested in your perspective, not only on kind of those key factors that Adam described, but one of the things that you and I often get to collaborate and work on together is when clients are sued or have subject to litigation or regulatory enforcement relating to their cyber operations And as a result, I think one key question is, well, what is the importance of privilege? How do you see those issues being playing out practically for organizations who find themselves within the crosshairs of the plaintiff's bar or from a government regulatory perspective? Yeah, so I think that that's a really challenging question, right? Because the way that you set up a privilege engagement with a third party assessor is Adam, you know, just discussed and, and the various factors that go into that, including the nature of the hiring and the timing of the hiring and who it's going through and how you paper the engagement. It's also important to know that if you're facing 
regulatory inquiries, a lot of the times regulators don't care if you have a privilege report and you have to make a decision if you're going to maintain privilege over an assessor's work in an otherwise privileged investigation and respond to a government's inquiry, especially if you're facing at the same time litigation by private plaintiffs where you absolutely do not want to disclose or you may not want to disclose a privilege report, right? And so I think it's a challenging issue. I think to Adam's point, five or eight years ago, there were pretty, I think, clear lines drawn about why it was important to maintain privilege over a third party assessor's report or why a third party assessor should be hired under privilege. And no one really veered from that. And I think given the way the case law has evolved and it really is dependent on the unique circumstances of the client, of the incident, of the threat and the issue and what the assessor is looking at. We do have clients who we've advised that it doesn't always make sense to have a third party assessor come in under privilege. And it may make sense instead to do a non-privileged assessment or to create two separate tracks or to bring in you know, two different assessors. And then you're in a position where you can respond to regulators and you can put forward a piece that is actually going to show the good facts of the investigation and why the company is in a strong position in private litigation, for example. And so you can satisfy multiple parties while also maintaining a really, really narrow and discreet sort of privileged engagement. And there are creative ways to do that. But I think that the point is that that issue that you've flagged, a lot of our clients are encountering and there's no one size fits all answer. It really is dependent on the circumstances and the objectives of not only the investigation, but the broader objectives objectives of the client when they're facing potential litigation or an active or potential regulatory investigation. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like if I'm understanding this correctly, as counsel, I mean, a lot of clients would come to us and they want us to make sure that we're getting the information to be able to advise them in the way that's going to protect their legal interests. That information may be good or it may be bad, right? To put air quotes around each one of those terms. The information may suggest everything was fine and they had no problems, or the information may suggest that there was problems, right? We all know that there is no such thing as perfect cybersecurity. And as a result, there's always going to be areas where risk was managed in ways that people may second guess. So an organizations really need to have the ability of communicating with their lawyers in a way that they allows them to be able to get representation to protect their interests under the law. And, and in order for the lawyers to be able to gain the insights and the technical information, we need to be able to be advised by the forensics companies. But I guess really where the rubber hits the road here, I think, is to do that type of assessment and to have a forensics firm to come in and to really dive into the root cause analysis, why something happened, you know, where it is that a cybersecurity safeguard fell down, whether there wasn't a safeguard in place, whether there was a safeguard that was configured imperfectly, who knows, any number of different scenarios that play out. But if that's going to become essentially exhibit A for you know the plaintiff's firm to come back and sue you, well, then better not do it, right? Like, I mean, it's almost like that's the incentive. Well, why would I go and pay a lot of money for a forensics firm to come in and create a record, which is then going to be used against me. It's not a shield, it's a sword almost. So, I mean, Adam, is that really kind of what we're talking about, right? In terms of the importance of getting this right and how that would actually play out in the event that we're in a situation where we're trying to defend ourselves in litigation or defend ourselves in front of a regulator? Yeah, the risk is very real, Scott, and the case law has gotten more challenging and plaintiff's lawyers and regulators alike have gotten more aggressive in demanding information from these types of investigations. And they've gotten much more sophisticated about knowing the types of work product that gets generated and targeting those specifically. And I think kind of one of the key decision points we've seen our clients confront and make calls about is precisely how to mitigate that risk. And one of the things they often do is to decide We don't want a full written report from the forensic investigator to be created that lays out in exorbitant detail all the findings of the forensic investigator and, you know, everything down to log level details and everything like that. Instead, they opt for more informal reporting, oral or otherwise, that can capture the essence of the investigation, but does not memorialize it in a way that can be potentially exploited by the 
plaintiff's lawyers or regulators who are looking for reasons to penalize a company regardless of what happened. And so I think that is a real key decision point that comes in. I think a lot of our clients, to Vasi's point, are still making a decision that it makes sense to bring in a vendor for a variety of reasons. They just don't have the expertise to do the work to find out what happened, or there is a key skill set that the vendor brings or other capabilities that they, again, don't have the ability to scale, either scale or just don't have. But that said, once the vendor hits the ground, managing what they do and managing their work product and all their outputs becomes critical. And one that we are often in a dialogue with the client about, does it make sense to produce this? Does it make sense to produce that? And thinking about the downstream long-term risks if that stuff gets created and being very thoughtful and practical about what they actually need to get to move the ball forward and complete the investigation and take whatever actions they need to take. And oftentimes that may not need a full-blown, massive 100-plus page report to do what they need to do internally. And if that report only creates more risk, there's less reason to prepare it in the first place. So super helpful. And I am convinced privilege, it sounds like, is one of the key components that we're thinking about what's unique about a U.S.-oriented insider threat investigation. Vasi, I'm interested in another component here that I know is unique or unusual in the way the U.S. legal system works, and that we have to recognize that an insider threat investigation entails us being looking and talking with people internally about their own conduct. And in some ways, you're investigating something that would suggest that you did something wrong, or at least the companies who are your representatives have done something wrong. How do you manage that dynamic where you are potentially asking really difficult questions that may have legal ramifications for the person who is answering them, and that person happens to be our employee? Yeah, so I have two thoughts in response to that. First is, you're right that an insider threat investigation is unique because you're going to be talking to a lot of people internally. And in fact, I think even in cyber investigations that are not insider threat related, that is also a part of an investigation is having conversations that are supposed to be candid yet protected under privilege with internal people who are internal to the company. And so I think the first piece around that is part of the maintaining privilege throughout the investigation while also making people feel comfortable to be able to share facts and help you uncover the next steps of the investigation is making sure that you know how to communicate to your to employees at the company. And part of that involves giving what we call up John warnings, which are sometimes called corporate Miranda warnings. And what that actually takes its name from seminal Supreme Court case up John v. U.S., in which the Supreme Court held the communications between companies, lawyers and outside counsel for the company with employees of the company are privileged, but the privilege is owned by the company and not by the individual employee. And so you are supposed to explain at the outset of that conversation that the lawyer represents the company and not the individual and anything revealed during the course of the interview is only privileged as between the lawyer and the company, not between the lawyer and the individual employee. And I think sometimes that sounds a little scary at the outset for people who are not accustomed to talking to lawyers, especially in the context of an investigation. And so what we often see is some of the employees of our clients that we speak to in the context of these interviews will say, well, am I in trouble? And do I need to have a lawyer here present? And, you know, just sort of asking a lot of questions at the outset. And so what I would say is first, really focus on building rapport with the witness, with the person that you're interviewing. And that starts from not only providing the Upjohn warning, because everybody has to be on the same page about this being conducted under privilege and whose lawyer it actually is, but making clear that, look, this person is not in trouble. Conclusions have not yet been made, that this is part of an ongoing investigation that is being run by legal counsel for the company. And the best and most important thing that this person can do is simply tell the truth and relay facts that they have personal knowledge of and that they understand. And I think it's not a perfect solve because people get nervous. And I think, you know, to the point that you made, you may be interviewing the subject you know, themselves. And that could be really tricky. But I think that 
also reemphasizes the importance of having, you know, sort of a key group of people running the investigation who are able to understand all of the angles, right? So maybe when you're interviewing employees, it's not just company legal and outside counsel, but it's also representative from HR who's sitting in the room, who can make sure and be a witness to the conversation, but within the confines of privilege and be someone that the subject or the witness understands is also in their corner from that perspective. Perspective. And so there are ways around it, but I think it all starts from the initial warning, or we would say disclosure, and then, you know, building rapport with the witness to understand, to help them understand what the scope of this really is. Yeah. So if that question that you posed is like, hey, do I need my own lawyer? It sounds like our normal practice, like we're not advising you about whether you need a lawyer or you don't, that's up to you and you know any lawyers that you have already engaged. But this conversation could well have legal implications for you, depending on what it is that you have done and what is it that you say, because this is importantly, I am not your lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice when I conduct this investigation, regardless of what you tell me. That's right. And I think reiterating that we are not your lawyer, right? We're a lawyer for the company. So I can't advise you on what you should do or should not do, other than to say that it is our job to investigate this issue as the company's lawyers and as a representative of the company, as an employee of the company, we would ask you that you tell us the truth, right? If you feel like you don't want to talk to us and you want to bring your attorney, you should feel free to do so. But I can't, you know, advise you to do that. And I think just reiterating the relationship between us as outside counsel or the in-house lawyer to the company is critical in that scenario. And if you're the one of those people who are being interviewed, Adam, it sounds like, you know, in addition to any unlawful activity that we may have to bring this information to law enforcement, I guess it's a real position that those individuals may be outside of compliance with company policy. Thus, their job may be at stake. How are you managing this, which for a conversation that you're having where you're trying to get out to the bottom of what this company is experiencing may have very real personal and practical effects on the person that you're speaking with. No, you're right, Scott. And it's really a delicate balance of being crystal clear with the employee about your role and what you can and can't do and what they're, you know, you're not counsel for them as Vasio was explaining. But at the same time, trying to elicit information of them that is very helpful for your investigation. And I think my, certainly my experience, and Vasi, welcome your perspective on this, is it takes a light touch, particularly with people who this may be their first time talking with a bunch of lawyers, right, on a call. And they're not surprisingly skittish, you know, not at ease. And be clear with them what your role is, but also try to don't come in pounding your chest, thumping the table and talking all sorts of legal jargon, right? You want to be able to clearly and reasonably try to elicit information from them in a way that doesn't make them clam up. And that is a often a skill that a lot of folks who do internal investigations have and to provide the warnings that you need to provide, but do it in a way that is not going to unnecessarily aggravate the individual's or create more tension than there needs to be in the situation. And so it is it is an art as opposed to a science on how you go about doing this in a really effective way that can help the company get all the information it can from its key stakeholders. Yeah, really good point. Well, Vasi Adam, thanks so much for joining this podcast. I think one of the things that we'll get into in a future episode is trying to compare the dynamics that you're describing about how to manage these issues from the U.S. to what we see the same types of issues come up in the EU and in Asia Pac, where there are different requirements relating to privilege and kind of different ideas of what privilege is. And as a result, any team who is looking at a global insider threat program or a looking to conduct a global insider threat investigation really needs to be sensitive to not only these rules for the U.S. audience, but then needs to be starting to compare that and work with inside the confines of the rules that would apply differently to European employees or differently apply to individuals 
and the People's Republic of China. And so I think that dynamic and the insight that you provided, super helpful for the U.S. And I'm looking forward to the continuing the conversation as we start to think about how to conduct this outside of the United States as well. So with that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and those are your data points. Mm-hmm.